if you're a Wisconsin Badgers basketball fan, I hope you're a Milwaukee Bucks fan too. Because for as bad as this Wisconsin Badgers season has turned, the Milwaukee Bucks season is turning out pretty good. It is this weird hot and cold opposites between these two teams. And we're going to dig into them just a little bit here on today's Scotty Six Pack podcast. Good morning and thank you for enjoying it with the Six Pack. The Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbris. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbris. And follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. Wisconsin Badgers are getting cold, <laughs> have been cold, need to warm up. And that's the complete opposite of what the Milwaukee Bucks are doing is the Bucks heat up. We've touched on it a little bit on the show in the last couple of weeks. We're going to dig into it just a little bit more here. Got some quick thoughts about the Wisconsin Badgers at the very top. Because look, it seems like you can only have one nice thing at once uh, if you're a Wisconsin sports fan. If you're a Wisconsin Hoops fan, you know, you 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 got some more things going on in the state, right? Marquette rolling, of course. But they have some injury problems of their own. Tyler Kolek's going to be out until the Big East tournament, at least. Meanwhile, today, as you're listening to this on Tuesday, March 5th, the Horizon League Conference Tournament starts today. UW-Milwaukee hosting a first-round game at the K. If they win, the Panthers will go up to green. Day for the rubber match against the Phoenix this season, each taking one game a piece there. Sundance Wicks, his first season as the Phoenix head coach, has that Green Bay program rolling. Uh, and they also have a potential conference player of the year there in the Horizon League up in Green Bay in a former Badger standout legend, Noah Reynolds. Uh, but let's let's pay attention to current Badgers here. Badgers. Very hot and very cold. And I went back and I listened to um, the the post-game comments from the players and Greg Gard after Wisconsin's loss to Illinois earlier this week. And, and there were, you know, just a couple of things that stuck out to me. The first was uh, a couple of players, a couple of guys, and Greg Gard pointed out, look, foul, foul trouble really hurt Wisconsin in that loss to Illinois. And... That has been a trend with this team as of late is really the big problem there, right? Foul trouble can, can be an excuse. It can be a legitimate one. But when it turns into a trend, it is a problem rather than an excuse. It is a problem rather than a reason for a loss. So I went back to thinking about the, the recent... Badgers streak of losses. If you start back in the game against Purdue, Stephen Crowell got himself in a little bit of foul trouble with four fouls in that game. A couple of them not even committed against Zach Eadie. You You go out and you play Rutgers. Rutgers kind of punches you in the mouth in that game. Um, later on, but before that, the game at Michigan, Stephen Crowell gets himself in foul trouble again, back-to-back -back games, has four fouls. Move ahead to the to the next loss at Iowa. Tyler Wall fouls out in overtime with five fouls. He's limited in his minutes and is stuck on the bench for a lot of that game. Indiana. You just played some real pathetic defense there. Not a ton of personal fouls called, whether that's an impact of the whistle or the effort and aggression of the Badgers' defensive effort. I don't know. And then against Illinois, of course, Stephen Crowell has four fouls. John Blackwell even fouls out in that game. We'll talk about that part a little bit at the tail end here. But I think it says something that this team is struggling to play defense so significantly. And I don't know if it's a cause or a symptom. I am led to think it is a symptom rather than a cause of playing poor defense right now. That this team in its front court, is having a very difficult time finding the sweet spot between playing aggressive defense and playing wild defense. When Stephen Crowell is consistently getting himself into foul trouble, when it's not Stephen Crowell, it's Tyler Wall, you have a very veteran front court. This is a Badgers team that is a very veteran, very old, very experienced team 
that should not have these problems of getting itself into foul trouble. This is where my doubts about Greg Gard do start to creep in. As you know, the the ongoing bit here being of Greg Gard, should he go, should he go or stay? This is where my personal doubts about Greg Gard are starting to creep in a little bit. Is when I when I look at this question of Wisconsin's defense right now, and in the games where Wisconsin is still not having a great defense, giving up 78 regulation points to Rutgers, for example. And then in other games, you got players fouling out in a and I don't know how to reconcile this idea of very porous defense at Indiana without getting in foul trouble versus maybe a little bit better, but still not great defensive efforts against other teams like, like Illinois. It's very hard. And, and Greg Gard was asked about his defense's effort in the game against Illinois. And Greg Gard mentioned that they had planned to go to the small ball lineup, which Wisconsin employed throughout that game with four guards. Uh, you had Tyler Wall, the only player in the front court, and then A.J. Storr, Max Klesmit, Chucky Hepper, and John Blackwell. But it is hard when you have to go small. Greg Gard mentioned, and, and I had kind of alluded to this in the preview episode for the game against Illinois, that going small against Illinois is probably good for Wisconsin's defense in that game. Talked about Stephen Crowell. Maybe he's not as good laterally to keep up with that really small starting lineup of Illinois. However, Stephen Crowell on offense against that small ball lineup for Illinois is probably a boon to you. So when you as Greg Gard are forced to go small ball, that's not as great because you don't get to choose when you can emphasize the offense in the game versus emphasize the defense in the game. And yes, we can debate whether or not Greg Gard is the right coach to you know push those buttons at the right time. But just taking that away really hinders his ability to even show his ability to be the best coach that he can be in those spots. Again, because foul trouble is becoming a consistent issue in these losses, it is a problem rather than a reason at this point. So I don't want to say that guard not having the ability to switch between small ball or put Stephen Crowell back at the five is a valid excuse for Greg guard. I'm not saying that at this point, but I do understand that it makes it quite a bit harder. And, and I thought it was compelling to hear Greg guard point that out in a way that at least aligned with my, my priors um, at the very least, right. Made, made me feel a little bit smarter. <laughs> no, but thought thought it was compelling because he felt it necessary to point that out, that going small is nice. And, and I was happy to hear that he had planned to go to it in this game already, but it's a lot harder when you have to go to it throughout the game. Um, Grigard also mentioned in these comments that when he kind of asked about the trajectory of the team overall, if it can get back to what it was pre pre February, margin for error in the Big Ten is slim. It's really slim, and it got me thinking. You know how sl how slim is it? Because some of the conversations. We as the general Wisconsin Badgers fandom, commentariat, folks covering the team, have had over the course of the last three seasons now, is Wisconsin's ability to win or lose in close games. Two years ago, that Badgers team won dang near every close game it was in. It defied the metrics. Last season... Wisconsin came back down to earth, lost a lot of close games. When the margin for error is slim, you're probably going to play in a lot of close games. And when you look at Wisconsin's losses in this stretch since February 1st, lost to Nebraska, eight points in overtime. Lost to Purdue, six points to the team that 
I think is probably going to end up with the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. Michigan, four-point loss. Rutgers, you got punched in the mouth and got destroyed. Iowa, two-point loss in overtime and had a real chance to win that game, both at the end of regulation and the end of overtime. Maryland, a four-point win. Ohio State, an eight-point win. Indiana, four-point loss in a game that the Badgers team again played abysmal defense. And Illinois, an eight-point loss to the team that probably at this very moment has the best offense in the country. The margin for error is incredibly slim. Lots of single-digit losses along the way. But when those losses continue to pile up, much like foul trouble, it becomes a problem rather than a reason. It becomes a problem rather than a legitimate excuse. Earlier in the season, Wisconsin was getting away with, with some things in single-digit games. Three and one in single-digit games. Games decided by single digits. It's a win over uh, Marquette, Minnesota, and SMU. And, of course, loss on the road at Penn State in a game where Wisconsin's poorest defense really came to light. This team has some problems. Margin for error is small. And some of these things that have been perhaps legitimate excuses in the past have happened too many times for them to stay at stay that. Now they are legitimate problems. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the Milwaukee Bucks are rolling. What's changed there? What? Can Wisconsin learn a couple things from there? Now the NBA is too different, but. I want to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks just a little bit, and we're going to do that after we talk to you about our friends over at TickPick, because TickPick is where I get tickets to any sporting event that I would like to attend. Uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, I'm, I'm reading a, a text message, a text message, who apparently I can't say that word, uh, that has come up on my phone about tomorrow. But on Thursday, Wisconsin basketball hosts Rutgers at the Cole Center. That game, of course, at 6 p.m., Tyler Wall's senior day. Technically went through some senior day festivities last year, but we don't have to remember that. Uh, Wisconsin Badgers host Rutgers. You can get into that game starting at $8 on TickPick. Eight bucks gets you into the Cole Center that night, and TickPick is going to get you the best deal on tickets anywhere that you could get them from because you never have to pay fees for tickets on TickPick. No service fees, no delivery fees, none of that nonsense. You're going to pay $0 in fees every time you use TickPick or sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, whatever live events that you would like to go to. If you use TickPick, you're going to get the best deal and pay no fees on tickets. Plus, if you use my link in the podcast description, the link that's on your screen now, you're going to save 10 bucks on your first order. So go to the Google Play Store, go to the Apple App Store, download the TickPick app. That's T-I-C-K-P-I-C-K. Never pay fees for tickets ever again. Coming up this week on the show. We're, of course, going to be talking more Wisconsin basketball. Um, Tomorrow, we'll be previewing Wisconsin's matchup with the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Uh, on Thursday, we'll be previewing Wisconsin women's hockey, having the, fro sorry, not the Frozen Four, the final face-off semifinals of the WCHA Conference Tournament. Wisconsin taking on Minnesota, part five of the border battle this season. Going to be a great one as always. And of course, we will have from 1075 the game, Madison, Noah Clark, who handles post game and intermission interviews for 1075 the game during Wisconsin women's hockey games. He, he'll be joining us to help us break down that exciting weekend, talk some Wisconsin women's hockey bracketology, uh, where the Badgers are going to fall in the bracket. Probably going to be hosting a regional next weekend. So, so stay tuned. Over to that, I also have a new piece on the Wisconsin women's hockey team up on the site over at Badger Notes. That piece is linked in the podcast description talking about some conference award finalists. Uh, Badger's probably going to walk away with some individual hardware this weekend as well. Uh, so click on over in my podcast description to read about those individual award finalists before those awards are handed out. Uh, give you a good primer for who is on the team. Talk a little bit about their accomplishments this weekend. Nice little companion to our episode. 
Uh, they'll drop on Thursday with Noah. Of course, Friday will react to Wisconsin's win or loss uh, against the Rutgers Scarlet Knights on senior night for Tyler Wall. And then on Saturday, uh, we'll preview Wisconsin's game uh, against Purdue on Sunday as the Badgers head to West Lafayette for one Zach Eadie's senior night. Uh, the Milwaukee Bucks are really rolling right now. Uh, rolling much more than the Wisconsin Badgers are, of course. And Milwaukee Bucks still have not lost since the All-Star break. Just racking up wins left and right. It, 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 is, it is incredible. And last night, the Bucks had quite an impressive performance. Come from behind victory, trailing most of the game, trailing until the fourth quarter. The Milwaukee Bucks dispatch the loaded LA Clippers with James Harden, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, all playing 113 to 106. Yes, the Milwaukee Bucks get a win over the Clippers. Even more impressive. Still no Chris Middleton. No Chris Middleton since just before the All-Star break. And no Giannis Antetokounmpo last night as he, you know, had some Achilles soreness is what it sounded like. Doc Rivers didn't make it seem like there was much of any concern there. But Milwaukee Bucks get a big win with, I mean, a hobbled, incomplete roster over a really good Clippers team. A Clippers team that's 39-21, and 21, just two games back of the Bucks in the win column, for example. And the Bucks do it on the back of... Damian Lillard and yes, Bobby Portis, Bobby Portis, who many, many, many of us have said needed to be off this team. He, he showed that he, he doesn't need to be off this team. He, he's playing pretty dang well. And look, he's played a lot better on the offensive end, playing efficiently, not chucking up random shots, playing a lot better on the defensive end, looking really great. I, I, Bobby Portis has been phenomenal in this game had everything right a 40 41 point outburst from Damian Lillard in 42 minutes Bobby Portis 28 points and AJ AJ Green near logo three it, it, it was incredibly impressive and although Giannis Antetokounmpo did not play in that game last night the, the Giannis Dame Brooke Lopez lineup has been elite uh this season with those three on the court since Doc Rivers took over the head coaching duties for the Milwaukee Bucks, the lineup of Damian Lillard, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Brooke Lopez, Jay Crowder, and Malik Be Beasley is second in offensive rating, second in defensive rating, and first in net rating among all lineups in the league. Team's got a bunch of dudes and still is not even at full strength with Chris Middleton still trying to get healthy. It, it has been impressive. And one of the other impressive things has been the way Doc Rivers has turned this team around defensively. In a game pre-Doc Rivers this season. That Milwaukee Bucks team would have just gotten shellacked at Pfizer last night. That team was not a good team defensively whatsoever and is now really turning it around. Doc Rivers saw that lineup and said, we don't got the guys. We don't got the guys. We don't got the one-on-one -on -one matchups to handle this incredibly talented Los Angeles Clippers team. And so what did the Bucks do? Bucks played a whole ton of zone. Played a whole ton of zone. And... It, it worked, took the Clippers to school, really couldn't do much with that zone. And uh, the other elephant in the room that I haven't mentioned is that Dame barely got a call last night. He, he could not do much of anything. It, it, it's It's been an impressive performance since the All-Star break for, for the Milwaukee Bucks, and things just continue to get seemingly better and better for them. I can't wait. Uh, Bucks play the Warriors on Wednesday night in San Francisco. That, that should be, I mean, a heck of a matchup. I can imagine the Bucs are, are going to win that game. I don't know if they'll technically be favored, but got to feel good about the Bucs, you know, in any game right now. And I didn't necessarily feel that way earlier in the year. 
Bucks doing it against solid competition. Well, they've played a lot of not fantastic teams since the All-Star break, but this win over the Clippers, the Bucks team that didn't have its full complement of players, still getting a win, grinding out a win. Looks pretty dang good. Looks pretty dang good. Turning it around, potentially, potentially lining up to get hot at the right time. I know it is just March 5th. March will soon turn into April, and April soon turns into playoffs. Can't wait. Cannot wait for it to happen. And as it does, we will cover it here on the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. Thank you for listening. Anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, while you're here, leave us a kind star, five stars. Kind star. Kind review. Five stars. <laughs> kind words. On your podcast platform of choice. You can also watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Six Pack. While you are there, smash the like button and hit the subscribe. And we'll be putting these in your feed six days a week. It's the Scotty Six Pack after all. On Wisconsin.